Thank you for being here today. Our country is a very divided country. As you have seen in many polls, that the Republicans and the Democrats are standing at about a 49 to a 51 percent margin. I want to say that to have the state of the church primary in unification is the purpose that God has in store for the body of Christ. I want to share with you today a very important message that I believe is primary to the faith and the growth of a church. We have been to this past, uh, we've been in the pastor here for about 13 years. And we have seen the ebb and flow of a roller coaster ride of great days and sad days. We've seen the church divided, and we've also seen the church unified. And I tell you, I believe one of the things that God wants more than anything else is to have a church that has a singular focus. And that singular focus is to the body of Christ be growing and strong, being focused on doing one thing. And that one thing is not to do all kinds of, of good things. It's being focused in doing what God has in store for the church, and that's reach people for the cause of Jesus Christ. Amen. I would like to tell you a story of a lady. A lady that I have read about many times. A lady that you have probably heard about, and maybe your preacher has even communicated about. It's a lady that was immoral. A lady that had been married five times, and she was drinking at a well. And my best friend came up to her, was talking to her. And my best friend just asked her, will you get me a drink of water? And she, being embarrassed of her life, and she said, oh, you don't know anything about me. You don't know what I've done, and if you'd known what I've done, you'd never talk to me. And my best friend just walked up to her and said, you know, I do know everything about you. I know everything about you. I know you've been married five times, and I know that the man you're living with now is not your husband. And he said, go ahead and drink my water. Because if you drink from the water that I give to you, you will thirst no longer. So for the very first time in her life, she felt satisfied. She felt her deepest needs being met. She ran back into the city. She went into the city and she told everyone that she knew to come out and meet the man that could change their life like he changed her life. They compelled Jesus to stay there for two days. And here's the scripture that's found in the Bible. In John chapter 4, verses 39 through 42. Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me that ever I have done. So when the Samaritan came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And they stayed there for two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this indeed is the Savior of the world. I believe it is the, the job of the church to communicate the real life issues that Jesus has performed within your life and allow other people to see what Jesus Christ could do in their life. If we stay focused on allowing God to meet the most deepest needs within our life, and God transforms our deepest need, your deepest need and my deepest need. And you would say to me, Pastor, what are those deepest needs? Can I share with you, each and every one of us have four core deepest needs that must be met and can only be met by God. We cannot be met by our spouse, our family, our resources. It has to be met by God. The first inner need is acceptance. We have to be know that we are loved by God. When we pray, when we wake up in the morning, that I know that God absolutely loves me. Acceptance. I could try to gain acceptance from a lot of different areas. I could try to gain acceptance because of my job or my position. But in every area of our life, when we try to gain acceptance, we lose our identity unless our acceptance is given to us by God himself identity. Know that you are significant. 
and who you truly are. I can be accepted by God, but the identity I get is not who I am. When I look in the mirror, I know that I have identity in Christ, and God has made me and created me for a purpose, and that purpose is to fulfill his will. And the third is security, knowing that everything will be all right. If I give God everything, I can trust God in everything. But if I give God almost everything, whatever I hold on to will soon slip through my hands. I have to give God my security, who I truly am, my kids, my family, church, my resources. If I try to hold on to anything in my own grasp, I will lose the thing that God has given to me. And then the last inner need that I have is purpose, knowing there's a reason for my life. I have to know that I'm here for a purpose. Well, one of my favorite movies of all time is called The Man in the Iron Mask. I've used this illustration many times. It was talking about two kings that were twin brothers, and the oldest king found out that he had a little brother. And they threw him into prison, and they put an iron mask on his face that nobody would know who he was. And the three musketeers found that out, and they found out that the older king was a wicked king. And they wanted to transplant or transplace the younger king into the kingship and a battle took place and the three musketeers at the end of the fight said something that I believe is so important to us as a church today as a body of Christ the three musketeers said this I've spent all of my life wanting to serve someone or something bigger than myself as an individual we cannot serve God the way that we can serve God as a corporate body and a family. But as the body of Christ, if you can comprehend, the body of Christ is a group of volunteers that automatically give of themselves, give of their resources for a singular purpose, and that's to worship Jesus Christ. It's not to come to church. It's not to gain from the church. It is to come to a body of Christ that is the greatest power on the planet of the earth is the body of Christ, volunteerism, to come to the body of Christ to reach others to what they have. We have to have a purpose. And knowing that the purpose that God has given to me is greater than anything that I could ever comprehend. So if we know that we have those inner needs within our life, all of us have those four inner needs, we may allow God to meet those inner needs, or maybe we try to give other people the opportunity to meet those needs. But if we give others our deepest needs, we will always be insecure. We'll always feel inadequate because God is the only person that if we're honest with him, that can meet our deepest need. <laughs> Ah, uh, there you go. All right. Let me give you the five-fold plan. How are we going to take this church in 2013? These are very simple, but I believe they're very important. I believe the first thing that we have to have is we have to have fanaticism. What does that mean? We have to be fanatical. Good days or bad days? I'm going to be honest. I know that I'm the pastor of this church, and I'm going to surprise you when I tell you I'm a Dallas Cowboy fan. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm a fan. I loved it in the 80s. I loved it when they won all their Super Bowls. I was the biggest fan when they were winning. You know what? If they're 0 and 16, I'm still watching the Dallas Cowboys. I got a couple fans there, all right? Okay, let me clarify this. If I was a Kansas City Chief fan, and they got the worst record in the NFL. And if they're going to get the number one draft pick overall, I would still be a Kansas City Chief fan. Why is that? It's because fanaticism isn't based on what's taking place. It's based on who you are. It's based on what's in your heart. And if you're a true fan, you're going to enjoy the great days. But you're still going to be a fan in the bad days. So in our life, we have to have fanaticism. 
We have to understand that I'm going to honor God in every situation, in the good and in the bad. When everything's on the top or when everything's in the valley, I am still going to honor God at all times. And as a body of Christ, we must be fanatical. We must not allow the circumstances of our life to be dependent upon whether I serve God or whether I have a passion for a church or whether I'm going to be true to my faith. Fanaticism is this. I am going to be faithful in all times, whatever takes place. There was a person, I believe, in the Bible that was the ultimate fanatic, and his name was Paul. You would think, well, I know Paul. Paul was the guy on Damascus Road that he used to be saw the blinding light, and he was blinded, and then all of a sudden, he started being a follower of Christ. I'd like to have Paul's life. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Well, let me tell you what a true fan would be. A true fan is when all these things take place with you, and you still follow after him. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 33, it says this. They say they serve Christ. I know I sound like a madman, but I have served him far more. I have worked harder, been put in jail more often, been whipped times without number, faced death again and again. Five different times the Jews gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I have traveled many weary miles. I have faced danger from flooded rivers, from robbers. I have faced dangers from own people and Jews as well as from Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in deserts, and on the stormy seas. I have faced dangers from men who claim to be Christians but are not, have lived in weariness and pain and sleepless nights. Often I have been hungry and thirsty. I have gone without food. Often I have shivered in the cold without, without enough clothing, to keep me warm. Then besides all this, I have the daily burden on how the church is getting along without me. This is a man that has lived his life for a singular purpose, and that purpose is to honor Christ in everything. He is the ultimate fanatic because he would never leave his Lord. That's the type of person that we as the body of Christ need to be. Not only do we need to have fanaticism, but we also have to have individual spirituality. Individual spirituality. And I believe the church will only be as strong as the individuals within the church. And I believe the only way that we can see what spirituality is, is the condition of the heart. I would love to see all of us have the corporate spirituality. And we know our spirituality because of the raising of the hands or the reading of the scriptures. But spirituality is who we are in the inner core of our life. And if we are going to be successful and unified as the body of Christ, as the church that God has called us to be, we have to be called to be set aside, to be set apart, and become the person that God has created us to be. In James chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, it says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. We must be spiritual. Draw near to God. If we as a church would say, I am going to draw near to God. In other words, I'm just going to walk closer to him. I'm going to allow him to impact my life. I'm going to let him communicate to me. I want to know what the scripture says. You know, we are a diverse people, just like our country. We have many different facets of our, of our church. We have many different opinions, and we have many different sides. That, that, that does not deter us from being the body of Christ. We have some people that are real spiritual, and we have some people that have no spiritual bone within their body. They come to church because maybe their parents or because their spouse makes them to come. We sometimes don't understand why they are here, and they don't understand what we are doing. But what it does, it allows us to be the church We do not need to be a church only full of people that identify with us. We have to be a church that identifies with Christ because Jesus spent his time with the sinners. He allowed sinners to spend time with him because he was strong enough to impact his life upon their needs. And that's what we need to do as the body of Christ. We have to know what we believe. 
We have to understand what the church holds on to, what the Bible says. And I've listed two or three things that I believe as a core principle of a church that you need to know that this church holds on to. The first thing it holds on to is the value and inerrancy of the Word of God. That everything that we teach and everything that we say, everything that we hold on to is through the very Word of God. It is our final authority. The second thing is we believe there's only one way to heaven. We believe there's only one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ and his shedding of his blood. We believe in the triune Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We do not understand the concept, but we believe the Bible is very clear that God, God the Father, God the Son, and the God, the Holy Spirit is triune in God. God, the creator of the world, sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for your sins and mine. And then he also sent to us a comforter, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives within each and every one of us. What makes you and me similar is that you and I both have a speck of God, the Holy Spirit, in our life. What makes us uniquely different than a non-believer is they do not have the Holy Spirit within our life. So how can we be unified? How do we understand what I'm saying, what you're saying, is because we have God within our life, the triune Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But I also believe there are two forces at work. I believe there is a person, an angel, called the devil, Satan. And he is our adversary. He does not like you, and he doesn't like me. And if we stick our head in the sand and say, Satan will not attack me, sin will not influence me, if we stick our head in the sand and say, I'm better than this, or I have this under control, that is the simplest way to say you are going to fail. Because we have to be alert. We have to be aware. Because Satan is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And what he wants more than anything else, he wants to ruin your life, and he wants to ruin the church, and he wants to make you of no effect, and he wants to make the church of no effect by losing the testimony that you have and the testimony that the church has. So the church has to understand, we have a purpose, and there's a fight in front of us. And not only do we need to have fanaticism, we need to be spiritual. We need to understand that there's a purpose within our life. We have some core values to hold on to. We have some things that we're going to live for and we're going to die for. We are going to die for the scriptures. We are going to live for the cause of Jesus Christ. We're going to believe that God himself has orchestrated within this church and within our lives a purpose that can change the world. Glenville is bigger than any one person. It is bigger than any one ministry. It is the body of Christ working together for a cause. And that cause is to bring glory to his name. And if we as the body of Christ bring glory to his name, his overflow, his blessing, will not only take care of the church, but it'll also baptize your entire family and your influence at work. God's blessing will be upon your life. That is the call that we have. We have a call to be spiritual. We have a call to be different. We have a call that when we become a fanatic... We become a fanatic for cause, not against something, but for something. We are for the cause of Jesus Christ. And if we stand for Christ, the thing that we stand against will never be mentioned because what we stand for captivates our thoughts, our energies, and our focus. We stand positive for the cause of Jesus Christ. The third thing. The third thing is volunteerism. Volunteerism. What, what is volunteerism all about? I believe if we have a passion for Christ, if you have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, if you have given your life to Christ, you owe Christ. You owe Him your life. See, we can look at this and say, salvation is free and the gift of salvation is free I didn't do anything for salvation 
But I can tell you, after I have been set aside, after I have accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, it is not free. It costs Jesus his life. It is not an easy street. When you look at Paul, the greatest fanatic that ever lived, he went through turmoil after turmoil after turmoil. And he would say when he said his life in 2 Timothy, he said, I have fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. I've finished the course. I'm excited about going on. He volunteered his life. How do we move from 2012 into 2013? It is very simply. We need the body of Christ to do one thing, to serve Jesus. Now, I'm not talking about worshiping Jesus. That's, that's a given. I'm talking about action. I'm talking about wherever my spiritual gift is, whatever it is that I have been gifted in doing, whatever I have within my spirit, I need to find a place, a person, to say, I want to pour my life into you. I want to encourage you. It may be singing in the choir. It may be in the drama. It may be in the nursery. It may be in the youth ministry. It may be in the children's ministry. But whatever it is, just to give your life to Christ, to give your family to Christ. Volunteerism. In Romans chapter 15, verse 1, now we are strong, ought to bear the weak of those without strength, and do not please ourselves. We ought to look for others and serve others. And the evidence of salvation and transformation is if, if we only serve ourselves, if we only get what we want, we are, we are self-oriented. But if we can look at what other people need, if we can look at what other people can go through, and we can give our life, our purpose to them, that is volunteerism. I like having structure. I like having order to a fault. But I believe a church needs to have so much diversity within the church that it is not only for one individual type or a group of people. I believe the body of Christ, I believe Glenville should have diversity. I believe it should have a wide type of diversity. And I believe if somebody comes into our church that is somewhat different than us financially or maybe, uh, maybe race, maybe the way they look or even how they act, I believe it's our job to point them to Christ because we have to realize Jesus died for you and he died for me and he uses our unique qualities to bring glory to his name and we have no idea what they are going through they have no idea what you are going through but when we are diverse in spirit maybe it's even our music Maybe it's the preaching. Maybe it's the teaching. Whatever it is. Maybe we should be more diverse. Maybe it should be more different. Because if I only like everything that takes place, you may not like that anything takes place. But if we both say this, you know what, I may not like that, but I know the next generation likes this, or the older generation likes this, or this style, or this style. We take our eyes off of everything that I want and put our eyes on what Christ wants because I love this phrase it's an audience of one the person that we are worshiping is not the worship pastor it's not the pastor the person that we're worshiping is God the Father and if I can open my heart and open up my eyes and lift my hands and allow him to be glorified in my worship I could care less what I'm seeing as long as Jesus is the real person who I am worshiping. Volunteerism. And then financial. I believe the financial aspect of the church is very important. And I'd like to use an analogy that we can all understand. Tax hike day has come and gone. The cliff was somewhat averted. But you know, my taxes went up $1,200 this year, and I don't make, I don't know if you knew this, I do not make $450,000 a year. And my taxes still went up. So, what does that mean? 
Here's how I put that into analogy in the church. We ask every person that comes to this church to sacrifice in their financial giving to this church. I ask you to do that for a purpose. And let me clarify what I need. What I am not asking for you to do is to raise your taxes so the government or the church could have more money to spend more money foolishly and needlessly. What I am asking you to do is to sacrifice your tithes and your offerings to give to the church so we can be more faithful in our debt, in bringing down our debt, and fulfilling God's call in ministry. And if we can fulfill God's call in ministry, not giving out entitlements, not spending money foolishly, not putting on amendments to bills so we can get some stupid money to fulfill something that is not needed. But I'm looking at what we can do if the cause of Christ would allow each and every one of us to say, if I would sacrifice, if I would tithe, imagine what God could do through me, giving of my resources, giving of my time, allowing God to work in me, through me, in my volunteerism and in my resources so the Lord can be glorified, so ministry could take place. And if we all sacrifice for the purpose of bringing down the debt of Glenville, reaching out in ministry. There's times in a speech where things have to be said that I think is very important. And I want to say this. I truly believe the way to grow the body of Christ, the way to grow the church, is not necessarily cutting ministry. The way to grow a church is to add ministry, is to look at ways that can reach more dynamics and diversity, how we can have more ministry, how we can have a bigger youth department, how we could ranch out in our children's ministry, how we could have a better nursery, how we could have more things to reach more people for the cause of Christ. Because if in the business terms, it's like this. You have to spend money to make money. You have to do ministry to reach people. And if we take that, I can't do anything else. I can't reach any more people. We don't have the volunteerism or we don't have the resources. We are going to stay in our own little bubble. And we'll never move the crowd into the core. We need to move those that are outside looking in to those that come into the pews. We have to move the ones that are just into the pews into the core, into the decision making, into the vibrancy of the church. And how do we do that? We do that by each and every one making a sacrifice to say, I'm going to sacrifice and be part of something bigger than myself. It starts with our heart. And what is out of the heart comes the issues of life. And the issues of life, the number one biggest concern in 2012 was our economic situation. Not only in our government, not only in your home, but also in the church. It is what compels me on a daily basis. It is what consumes me more than anything else at this church. Is are we going to be able to take on the financial responsibilities for the upcoming year? It consumes me. And I want to be consumed for people, not for debt. I want God to bless our church so much that it is not about whether we have to pay another million dollars for a facility that we can come in and worship. I want the facilities to be dead and gone. I would even tell you right now that seven years ago, if I knew that I would be up here still a million dollars in debt, $4,000 a week, $16,000 a month to have a building that we could worship in, I would say, let's sell everything and move into a school and pay a monthly debt so we can do more things for the Jesus Christ. Why? It's because I don't want anything to hinder our vision to reach people for Christ. Sometimes a facility that we worship in can be the hindrance of us have a passion for Christ. Oh, it's fun, it's enjoyable, it's comfortable. Yeah? Is it our life-saving station? Do we just have more people in it so they can enjoy? Or are we bringing people into the body of Christ so we can reach the core need that they have and that salvation? That is the purpose of the church. That is the challenge that God has instilled within our life. Not to be sitting and be satisfied, 
but to be moved with compassion, to never leave our first love, to not be satisfied in going to church, but allow God to motivate us deep within our soul, to have a passion, to have a compulsion that I am going to do whatever it takes to reproduce myself with those that need Christ. <laughs> and then unified. As we said before, I believe the one thing that God desires more than anything else is to have a church that is unified. Now let me tell you about what unification means. It does not mean that you agree with everything that takes place. Because there's no way a church of our size is going to agree with everything that takes place. But what happens at this church is that you elect a board. And you elect a board that's called deacons. And that board of deacons works closely with the pastor and the pastoral staff in order to reach the goals and the vision that this church has laid out. What happens when you elect your represent, representative as a deacon, and we speak and we communicate, we come up and we try to come up with what God has in store for this church. And then we bring to a conclusion the direction that God has laid upon our hearts. What we must have is we must have a unified body. A lot of people, a lot of people can't be a deacon. A lot of people, let me, let me tell you why. What sometimes you see on Sunday morning in church, sometimes you see the music and the singing and the preaching, that's the pretty side of church. That's, that's church. But you know what is real church? Is the underbelly scars and hurts and devastations of lives and pains and divorce suicide addictions affairs catastrophic tra catastrophic events that the pastors we go in and we try to minister to we ask our deacons to help us make decisions in sometimes the underbelly of the church is not very pretty but I tell you, if we don't deal with the underbelly, if we don't deal with the issues of life, we will never have a unified body on the surface. That's why it's so important to pray. That's why it's important to look at what church is all about. My job, I wish my job was to stand up here and preach to you for 30 minutes every Sunday morning. I wish that was my job. My job my calling is when I look in your eyes and see you on Sunday morning I know what you've gone through I know your pain I know what your family is going through I know what your issues are and I've prayed for you I've talked with you I've been with you during funerals I've been with you during surgeries I've laughed with you and I've cried with you I've lifted you up to the throne of God when you didn't think anybody else would and then I get to preach I don't want to be called a preacher because I don't want to be your preacher I want to be your pastor I want the body of Christ to be so unified that you do not have to agree with everything that takes place but you know everything that takes place is to bring glory and honor to God that's how we become unified. So what is our motivation? I want to tell you this is what we need to do. In the body of Christ. In the state of the church. In your life and my life. First thing, positive. be positive. We must be positive. We must be positive in our thought life, and in our actions. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, Finally, brother, whatsoever is true, whatsoever is honorable, whatsoever thing is just, whatsoever is pure, whatsoever is lovely, whatsoever is commendable, 
if there's be any excellence, if there's anything praiseworthy, think on these things. Think on these things. Don't allow the deceit of Satan, the lies of Satan, to deflect the blessings of God. Whatsoever thing's pure, whatsoever thing is right, whatsoever thing is pure, think on these things. Baptize your mind with the word of God and don't allow the lies of Satan to deflect who you truly are and what the purpose of the church is all about. It's not about you. It's not about me. The purpose of the church is about Jesus. God has called us. He has set us apart. He has put us in place to build something bigger and greater than ourselves. That's how we know that we are here for the right reason. That's why we know what our purpose is, is that we can stay pure in our thoughts and our lives. The second thing is joyful. Joyful. Rejoice always. I believe a church service is not a memorial service. I believe the Christian life is not something that's dreaded. It's not something that we drag through and we frown from. It's not something that we have to do. We are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ that have been transformed for a new work to, to bring within our hearts and bring within our life something that we know we have been saved from the pit of hell. We've been saved from our sins for a cause. I can be joyful about that. I want people to know about that. I don't want when we leave our church service and we go to a restaurant and we're all mean and drudgery and everything. Man, how I was church today. It must have been terrible. I think we ought to have a cause for Christ. We ought to be joyful in our spirit. We shouldn't be sad. We shouldn't look around down on other people because they're not like us. We should pray for them. We should encourage them. We should be joyful that God has put us in a place that we could have the cause of Christ. So we need to be positive. We need to be joyful. But then we need to be prayerful. We need to be prayerful. We need to pray. Because this world is against you. And it's against the body of Christ. And they do not want us to succeed. They do not want you to succeed. Satan wants you to be miserable. And the only way that we pray is when we get on our knees before God. And we say, Lord, I need your help. I can't do this alone. I need you. We need to be more prayerful. I need your prayers. My family needs your prayers. The staff of this church needs your prayers. The deacons of this church need your prayers. Families of your church need your prayers. You say, I don't know what to pray for. Open your eyes. Look around. If you don't see somebody that is in need, you are very inward focused. You can open your eyes in your home and spend 30 minutes in prayer just by looking at your kids and looking at your spouse and seeing what they're going through at school, the temptations that they go through, the fears that they have, praying for their future. And then it wouldn't take long just looking in a mirror and then you could spend a couple hours right there. But then you could look around to people that love you, that are supposed to be your spiritual leaders, and pray for them. Because Satan wants to destroy your church. He wants to. What we must do is we must pray and ask God's hedge of protection around the church and around your families. And then we need to be grateful. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God through Christ Jesus to you. Just be grateful. You know, when you start looking around and then you'll the old saying, what's normal? Well, there's a lot of hurting people. There's a lot of people that have it a whole lot worse off than you do and a whole lot worse off than I do. And there's some times that I can just say, Lord, thank you. I'm just going to be honest. I like what I have. I like where you put me. I can go to the hospital rooms and I can get depressed pretty quick. I could look at other people's situations and I can get depressed pretty quick. So there's times and I can just say, thanks. I'm, I'm pretty good. I, I, can, I can see your hand upon my life and allow God to know 
that you're grateful. Allow God to know your heart. I still need you, but I am so thankful for you. And then the most important one is I believe this year, you and I, we need to be the witness. We started off a story about a woman at the well, a Samaritan woman. She just talked to Jesus. And Jesus told her everything about her life. And do you know when she went back into Samaria, you know what she said? She said, I want to tell you a man that knew all about me. What? All about me. He told me things that no one else knew. When we share what Jesus has done with us and for us and how he has changed our life, it will bring a spark into people's lives because people are in need of something bigger than themselves. They need that interdependence upon God. And when people that are hurting hear that Jesus has transformed your life, that they see that your deepest needs have been met through God and they are struggling with some of their independent needs, they hear that. They compel Jesus to come into their life then your testimony to them will be their testimony back to you is this. I don't believe in Jesus because of your words. I believe in Jesus because of his words. Our job as a church is to bring people so they can hear about Christ. So Christ can transform their life. So they have faith not in you. They have faith through you. You are a vehicle that people can hear about Jesus. We need to be a witness. Just like the woman at the well, this goofed up woman that had all kinds of needs within her life, Jesus did not and he would not say no. He looked at probably the, the, the woman or the person that needed him the most and he opened his arms widest because of her need and what we need to do is look for people that are in need of Christ in need of your touch and be a witness just share about Jesus and allow God's power to go through you allow them to see Christ and I believe the state of the church will be unified if we do one thing it's not about you it's about him be unified knowing there's going to be different opinions there's going to be different views there's going to be things done and things said ministries you may not agree with things that ministries do that you say why but point to this is it glorifying to God Whether I like it or not is not the issue. The issue is, is Jesus being honored? And if we can have a church that's unified, that understands, if somebody asked you a question, what is Glenville all about? You could answer it in one word. And what would that one word be? Jesus. We're all about Jesus. That is how we will take 2013 to be uniquely different than any other year. We're going to do it because Jesus is power. We're going to do it because of ministry. We're going to do it because we sacrifice. We're going to do it because we need to do it. We are compelled to do it. I am called to do it. I want to give to you a future. A future of power future of grace I want us to look back at this year in 52 weeks and we say wow God is good how do we do that each and every one of us sacrifice for the cause of Christ each and every one of us give for the cause of Christ each and every one of us do for the cause of Christ each and of worship 
And if our eyes are on him, even as the serpent was in the wilderness, Moses lifted the serpent up. And if anyone would look at the serpent, they would be healed. And I truly believe our job is to lift up the cause of Christ and the name of Christ. And he will heal you and he will heal others that are in need, that are sick. That is the state of our church. God bless you.